But uh, I, we, are delighted to be able to report to you this morning that the conditions on Salt Creek have mitigate, mitigated greatly, uh, and they're greatly, uh, have greatly improved overnight. As you can see from these images, the water has uh, gone down significantly. And as a result, we're no longer encouraging uh, the North and South Bottoms neighborhoods to voluntarily evacuate. All those who did evacuate can now safely uh, go home. And we're pleased to announce that most of the major streets and roads in Lincoln uh, have reopened. Lincoln has faced three major historic crises over the last eight years, the Great Recession, the deep drought of 2012, and now the historic crusting of Salt Creek, which nearly topped the levee. Once again, I'm given occasion to admire the good sense and the resiliency of the people of Lincoln in both preparing for the unusual uh, and in reacting to the unusual. This community should take great pride in how the various uh, local government agencies have worked together and worked with other local organizations to keep us safe. The Lincoln Police and Fire were involved, the County Sheriff's Office, the Lower Platte NRD, our Public Works and Utilities Department, our Health Department, and others. As a result, we saw no injuries in this emergency situation and we continue to learn from our own experiences on how better to imagine, manage and coordinate our response. We do not know how many of the residents in the affected area spent the night with family or friends. Three residents did spend the night at the F Street Recreation Center. We're grateful to our Parks and Recreation Department for opening up their facilities and we're grateful to the Red Cross uh, for providing services. Uh, they uh, have been uh, with us uh, from the beginning, uh, and their local chapter has been a, a great unit to work with. Uh, Lauren is here today uh, representing the Red Cross. On behalf of the entire community, Lauren, I want to thank you for uh, the services that you so quickly provide when people are at their lowest. The, the Red Cross is there to help them get back on their feet, and that's a great, great thing. The Salt Creek water uh, level was an historic uh, event. We believe that it was the highest crest in Salt Creek since 1908. Official records go back to the 1940s and 50s, but the NRD tells us that this incident exceeded anything on the record books. We are very fortunate that the flood control measures that were in place held. Salt Creek <coughs> actually did not flood. It did not top the levees. The water in the neighborhoods was the result of the stormwater drainage system being at its capacity and not being able to drain completely. This again points out the importance of the stormwater management efforts that continue in our community. Every few years, uh, as you know, we take a stormwater bond issue to the community and every time they pass it the public understands the importance of these efforts in keeping the community safe. This storm also, again, demonstrated the long-term uh, value of the Antelope Valley project. You have all seen the dramatic pictures of the full channel as it runs through Union Plaza. Imagine now that all of that water was spread throughout the heart of the community. The damages from this one storm alone would clearly have been in the tens of millions. The Antelope Valley Project is saving lives and money and will continue to do so for a long, long time. One of our partners in that project was the Lower Plaza South NRD. Its staff was closely monitoring the situations yesterday and used, in fact, sandbags at some locations to reinforce the levees, and Executive Director Glenn Johnson is uh, with us today to give you an update 
on their activities. Glenn? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> As the Mayor said, the, uh, the water's going down. That's the good news. And it will continue uh, to go down throughout the day. And, and uh, as the, uh, the system drains itself out, uh, the, uh, the, the Salt Creek Flood Control Project actually is three different components. Uh, it's the upstream reservoirs, such as Branched Oak and Wagon Train and Stagecoach and Conestoga, that uh, capture the rains first and store a lot of floodwaters before they ever get to Lincoln. Uh, in between there and Lincoln is Wilderness Park. Wilderness Park is uh, eight miles of open wooded floodplain, this open space. It's just a big, huge sponge out there, a big reservoir. And that all fills up with water. And then it funnels into Lincoln and has to work its way through Lincoln through the levee system along Salt Creek. And all of it functioned just as it was designed properly to do and worked very well. Uh, it, it was a historic high. And uh, we were uh, very concerned, and that's why we, working with uh, all the folks here, uh, made the decision uh, with them that probably, uh, you know, an evacuation was, was an, uh, uh, an advisable uh, issue to do at that point in time. But again, um, the waters did uh, start coming down after that, and uh, we've been out monitoring it all the way uh, with the Corps of Engineers here, with their technical assistance helping us. We've been inspecting those levees continuously as the water level came up, as the water level stayed, and as the water level recedes. Uh, there are a few areas that we've had to do some attention to, and there will be some. We'll do a very close inspection when the water continues to go down. Uh, there will be some other areas that we'll probably have to uh, pay some attention to to uh, reinforce it. And um, I say we'll be, uh, if the rain comes again, which it will, at some point in time, um, the system will be ready to take that. Obviously, we're a little concerned if it comes too soon. <laughs> and, uh, and we're sitting on very wet uh, ground conditions in the watershed. And so we, we will stay vigilant, watch the weather service, and uh, be ready. Uh, but um, the weather forecast sounds like uh, the rains will not be significant rains uh, when they do come. So, thank you. Glenn and his staff, who are blessed to have in this community, uh, have been doing great work, have always done great work. Uh, Glenn made an interesting observation uh, while we were all meeting early this morning. Uh, he pointed out that this particular storm, contrary to many others that have pressured uh, Salt Creek uh, originated also not just in the outlining areas but in our community itself there were heavy rains. In prior times there had been times when the levee had been pressured but most of that pressure came from rains in the contributories or, or away from Lincoln that then came down the river and, and pressured the levee where Lincoln itself did not have excessive rains. This situation was different. There were excessive rains in the outlying areas, but also in Lincoln. And that meant that our local system <clears throat> uh, was more taxed than would be usually the case. And therefore, there was more water on Lincoln's streets and in certain pooling areas and in certain storage areas in the, in the city. And that's, why, uh, and that's why it's hard for people to understand uh, how the water got there, but the levees didn't, uh, didn't break. So uh, with that, let me uh, also invite uh, Tom Cassidy, our public safety director up here, who's uh, uh, been on the front lines in a leadership position here to update us on what he knows. Thank you, Mayor. We had a, a long day in the uh, Emergency Operating Center uh, uh, yesterday and a very busy day for uh, uh, our dispatchers, our police officers, our, our firefighters, uh, all of our volunteers, our, our emergency management staff, and, and uh, many others. Uh, uh, Lincoln Police Department responded to 445 uh, incidents in total yesterday, which makes that a very busy day. 
Lincoln Fire and Rescue handled 107 dispatches yesterday, also a very busy day. And uh, those fire crews in particular, uh, you know, were busy all day and all night. And uh, even early this morning when we had a, uh, a greater alarm fire that broke out at the, uh, at the flame shop of 5,500 Cornhuskers. So the same people were on duty this morning handling that as had worked all through the, uh, the flood event yesterday. Uh, I want to apologize to 60 or 70,000 people, including several that are here, whose commute we made miserable yesterday. Uh, I want to assure you that it really was something that was unanticipated and unavoidable. Uh, we will try to do a better job uh, in the future, but uh, you know, as, as uh, the mayor pointed out, uh, the last time Salt Creek was this high was uh, in 1908. So in, in 21, 23, I think we'll be uh, better prepared to handle the traffic. Uh, it, it did come up suddenly, and that's uh, uh, one of the th things I want to emphasize. Uh, we were all gathered down in the Emergency Operating Center watching and uh, getting uh, Glenn Johnson's reports from the downstream gauges, uh, but we could see with our own eyes uh, what was happening in Salt Creek by watching uh, these remote cameras. And uh, we had a, a pretty sudden rise between about noon and 2 o'clock, and uh, by shortly before uh, 3, uh, we were all gathered up, and, and uh, Glenn was explaining to us that we only had about a foot of freeboard left at the lowest spots in the levee. And we made the decision then that we better get moving on, on, uh, on trying to get some people extracted. One of the problems uh, we anticipated is that we would have people in the north and south bottoms who weren't able to simply walk away to, to dry ground. We have people that are disabled, people that have mobility issues, uh, complex medical issues. We've seen this in prior disaster situations here in Lincoln, and those were the people that we were really worried about and wanted to make sure that both they and their friends and relatives had plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, time to get out in the event that we did top the levee, because had that occurred, uh, the, the, uh, the, the water would have spilled into those neighborhoods uh, quite quickly, and uh, you know, you'd suddenly go from being uh, okay in your living room to being uh, waist deep. Uh, so that's why we made that decision uh, I think it was clearly the right decision to make. And about the same time that we were doing that, we also had water that began to flow across O Street, across A Street, and across Antelope Valley Parkways. These are obviously three major uh, commuting routes, major arterials. Uh, water was across uh, A Street, West A Street, at two different spots. Uh, if you drive out there today, you'll, you'll see the evidence of that and all the debris and mud. Uh, Antelope Valley Parkway, uh, two different spots. West O Street, roughly in front of the Runza restaurant, uh, went from having a little bit of water in it to being uh, uh, up, uh, up to about the top of a, of a, of a hubcap. So uh, that's why we had to close those roads. That's why we had to do it on short notice. And uh, it made for a miserable commute, but I think it was the right thing to do. I particularly want to uh, uh, give a tip of the hat to uh, to the men and women at Lincoln Fire and Rescue, who were probably the most taxed of the emergency services providers yesterday, uh, working in the water and getting people out. And as I said, they had a very busy day, and I'd like uh, Chief Huff to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Tom. Um, we've had a couple of busy days. Uh, obviously, you've all been uh, watching and seeing those things. Our call volume uh, literally doubled, in fact, a little more than doubled uh, during the, the storm event that started. Uh, Thursday night, and uh, a lot of our operations uh, were helping people who had driven into uh, the floodwaters, unfortunately, and then uh, the car stopped and uh, the, the water was too uh, swift or un they were unsure what to do, and so we had to rescue them or assist them out of their vehicles. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we've tried to deliver that message that if there's water on the street, don't drive through it. You can't tell how deep it is, and unfortunately, uh, many people uh, didn't heed that advice. We did have a couple of uh, situations. Um, we had some propane tanks uh, on West O Street that uh, we, we needed to assist uh, the business there in securing them. Uh, a couple of tanks in the rail yard that we helped with. Black Hills, uh, we helped them with some accessing so, some uh, control valves to make uh, the, the natural gas distribution system safe. We had to help them protect it a little bit. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we assisted folks in both the south and north bottoms uh, to evacuate. And those were done very orderly. Uh, I think people were very um, uh, wary of, of and listening to the elected officials' advice to, to uh, relocate, and we appreciate everybody's doing that. Uh, this morning, about 4.20, we, <laughs> business, the beat goes on, uh, we had a, a third alarm fire uh, at 5500 Old Cheney Road. 
Um, we're still on scene. We're still working that incident. Uh, made a pretty good stop. We we have uh, some significant damage to a portion of the building, the strip mall there, and the businesses. But I think overall we've uh, we've gotten through that fairly well. Um, yesterday we did something uh, that's somewhat unusual. Uh, we do have we do uh, have a urban search and rescue team here. You all have heard of that. Uh, it's a toolbox that we have available for local incidents, and we dipped into that toolbox yesterday, pulled out some assets, some water uh, craft, and some other things. And that's one of the benefits of having the team here is those resources are readily available, and uh, we did have them uh, easily accessed and and staged uh, in case we needed them. We hope to return to normal operations today, uh, ideally uh, by midday or maybe a little bit sooner. Normal operations to me means everybody is ready to respond to emergencies and they're not actually out working this, uh, this event. So that's kind of our plan for the day. Uh, those plans don't always work out the way we hope, but our goal is to be back, uh, back to business as normal here uh, shortly. So any questions for me? Thank you. John, thank you. Okay, let's talk about uh, a related but different aspect of this particular crisis. Uh, as we announced uh, yesterday to you all, the city's Teresa Street Wastewater Treatment Facility did reach full capacity and was, for a period of time, discharging untreated sewage and rainwater into Salt Creek. We have now stopped the discharges, but for health and safety reasons, it is very important that residents avoid contact with the water in Salt Creek, Antelope Valley, and any other high water areas. Public Works and Utilities officials notified the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality of the discharges as required. This type of discharge is normally prohibited. However, local officials can take action like what we did to protect infrastructure and to prevent further sewage backups. Public Works and Utilities Director Mickey Esposito and Assistant Director, no, just Mickey, is going to be here to explain this situation, is here to explain this situation. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just, to touch a little bit on roads, they're really looking good. Thank you, Tom, for the summary uh, as well. But I do want to recognize and acknowledge our street crews who worked overnight. Um, they'll continue, they continue to uh, remove barricades, street, sweep streets and clear debris. Um, so they're addressing those things as the water has receded, making them passable. I also want to thank the public for um, your patience in dealing with traffic congestion and detours and the barricades themselves and turning around and finding alternative routes. Thank you for listening. We, we do appreciate your cooperation and apologize for any inconvenience that we've caused. Um, at this time, all utilities are stable and operating normally, including Lincoln Water, Wastewater, and the Landfill. Um, but relative to the wastewater discharges to Salt Creek, we want to provide you with some additional information and updates. Uh, first, the wastewater treatment plant at Teresa Street is currently stabilized and running at normal levels, processing about 36 million gallons of water per day. During the and following the storm, our system was inundated with rainwater. And for a period of about 12 hours, we had to run the system at 105 million gallons per day. <coughs> Therefore, we had to do something extraordinary. Uh, we had to bypass the treatment process, discharging raw sewage mixed with rainwater uh, into Salt Creek. Like a relief valve, the purpose of a bypass is to keep from overwhelming the treatment plant during emergency events like these. It's designed to protect the infrastructure as well as prevent additional backups into individual homes. From a regulatory standpoint, this is why bypass systems are in place for emergency purposes or extraordinary circumstances only. Otherwise, bypass is prohibited. It's a prohibited practice under our state permit. And what we're balancing when we're making a decision to bypass the system is the abundant water levels in Salt Creek allowing dilution of the waste material versus compromising the treatment infrastructure and or causing more people to suffer backups in their homes. We've been working very closely with the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality and we'll actually finalize an official report for them today. Um, they'll review that report and we'll continue that dialogue with that regulatory agency. 
Um, I do want to note that we discontinued bypass at 9 p.m. last night, and I do have our utilities director, Donna Garden, here to answer any questions you have. Okay. okay. Uh, officials at UNL did ask us to let you all know so that you can let uh, a, a great many people who are interested know that all UNL parking lots are now open and commencement ceremonies will take place as planned. Uh, the heavy rains, uh, as is obvious, did cause many county roads to be closed also and two bridges, as I understand it, were washed out. Uh, county engineer Pam Dingman is here to update us on that situation. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Beitler. The bridges um, at 99th and Pioneers, as well as Sprague and Southwest 14th Street, those areas remain closed. Uh, to us in the county where uh, we don't have the, the level of uh, levy system or protection uh, that is needed and required through the city, we still have most of the areas um, in the Salt Creek drainage basin where anywhere where Salt Creek would cross one of our roads, they are still closed. We are advising people, turn around, don't drown. Last night, uh, as I looked at several of our facilities in the northeastern quadrant of our county, I was shocked to find children and many adults playing in or near the water. Please know that these conditions are dangerous. As was stated, the water itself is dangerous, but we don't always know what lies beneath our infrastructure. In many areas, we still have the roads and bridges closed pending engineering inspections of the roads and clearing of debris. We are humbly asking that you do not go around the barricades because we do not know if all the structures are safe at this time. Me and my staff will continue to inspect these structures and verify their safety prior to opening them. In addition to the areas that we have of concern, uh, the railroad also had several areas of concern and we have a closure at Southwest 56th near Pioneer, actually from Pioneer to Clare, and on A Street, Southwest 112th to Southwest 126th, where railroad structures were in danger, and we have closed those areas so that the railroad can take care of their needed infrastructure inspections and infrastructure rehab prior to opening those roads. I also would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pam. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there were in fact no injuries resulting from uh, this particular sequence of events. Uh, but anytime you have this kind of uh, incident, there are uh, public health concerns that remain after the event. People right now are dealing with sewage backups and other uh, flood cleanups. Mold can become a big health issue down the road. So Judy Halstead with our, our health director with the Lancaster, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department is here with more information in this area. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Judy. Um, Judy Halstead, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. Um, I'm here to give a little bit of information about what the health department's role was yesterday. Um, we work in, in cooperation and collaboration with our community partners. So uh, Red Cross sets up the shelter and we have our nurses there to be able to do health assessments, help with getting medications if folks couldn't get their medications out, um, and be able to work with immediate crisis needs. Uh, in addition, Animal Control works with Capital Humane Society, and so at F Street, they were Animal Control was available to transport animals to Capital Humane Society, um, and so we really appreciate that staff. And um, many of our environmental folks uh, fielded questions last night. That will continue, and so I'm basically here to talk to you about people and pets today. Um, I'm, I'm uh, talking about staying out of the floodwaters. I have to continue to ask, stay out of the floodwaters. Um, we don't want people swimming in Salt Creek. We don't want people swimming in the Antelope Valley Creek area. We want them staying out of the areas, particularly as Pam mentioned to our county folks, stay out of those areas. Um, there may be sewage in those areas, but in those areas where there isn't sewage, there by now is likely bacteria. And you can be very quickly infected with the bacteria that's in flood water. So we really need people to stay out of that. 
Um, as people become, begin their cleanup in their homes, we are asking wherever possible for you to use professional cleaners to do that. We want them to do the professional remediation. Um, if that's not possible, uh, if you're on the waiting list or you have to do some immediate cleanups, um, we have some basic messages related to that. It is on the front page of the city's website at lincoln.ne.gov. Um, in addition, in relationship to mold, you can go to lincoln.ne.gov and put in the keyword mold and you'll get information on preventing mold. But just as basics, um, we don't want children or pets involved in the cleanup at all. Um, I need to remind folks, we care most about obviously our humans, but we also care about our pets. 80% um, of the injuries that happen in disasters happen post the crisis. They happen as the cleanup occurs. And so we really want people to be cautious. Many people have been up for two nights in a row. They're very tired. Um, but we want to make sure that we can prevent as many injuries as possible. And we want to prevent disease. As I mentioned, there is a lot of bacteria that is potentially in those floodwaters. So as you're cleaning up, obviously wear rubber gloves when you can, wear boots when you can. Make sure if you cannot clean and disinfect it that you throw it out. Um, I know that's a difficult decision for people, but if it cannot be cleaned, if it cannot be washed, if it can't be disinfected, you're going to need to throw that out. Uh, in addition, as we're looking at going forward, for individuals who have not had a tetanus shot that they can remember, we're going to ask them to call the health department at 402-441-8065 to talk to a nurse about that. We are going to be running tetanus clinics. Um, we will have tetanus available starting now um, for individuals who need that. In addition, we'll have a tetanus clinic tomorrow. But uh, we're asking everybody who has questions about tetanus and whether or not they need a shot to call the number at 402-441-8065. We're also asking those individuals who um, have concerns about their environmental cleanup or mold to call the health department at 402 441 8040, that's 402-441-8040. Um, in addition, the Red Cross um, will also assist those individuals since we have closed the shelters now. If individuals are returning to their homes and realizing that maybe they can't stay there, it's worse than they thought it was. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Lauren is here and he's available to answer questions, but to give you the Red Cross assistance number, it's one 844 334 7569. And in addition to that, Salvation Army has just let us know that they have buckets and some cleanup materials for low income families who may not be able to afford those or have those on hand. It's the Salvation Army at North 27th and Potter. Their number is 402 474 6263. That's a new number. That's 402 474 6263. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, we've been partnering with the Capital Humane Society. The Capital Humane Society, as families who are flood victims, um, are trying to get their homes cleaned up. We don't want pets in that water either. Pets can become very ill from that bacteria as well. If individuals have questions about that, if they've already had their pets drink in the water, um, and you start to question some things with your pet, they have vomiting or diarrhea, please contact their vet. Um, for those individuals that need to do cleanup and they have no place, no friends or family who can take their pets, Capital Humane Society will still take pets for flood victims. Um, at their Park Boulevard location, that's at 2320 Park Boulevard, and their phone number is 402-441-4488, and they will be able to assist um, in, in taking care of their pets for a while. So i um, be happy to answer any questions at the end of the press conference, but that's our general information at this point. Thank you, Mayor. Judy, thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, if you have a little additional patience, uh, we have one more important aspect of things that uh, we wanted to mention. Uh, through our emergency management director, Jim David Saver, this is the beginning of, uh, of a long season of potentially uh, hazardous events, and so we wanted to ask uh, Jim to come forward and talk a little bit about that. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity. I want to commend the others who have shared with us the response and recovery efforts to this point. So looking forward, we're in a good place in that regard. I want to speak a bit to prevention. Uh, we promoted that the last week of March during Severe Weather Awareness Week. We want people to make sure that they have a plan in place. Probably at the top of that list is preparedness at home. Do you have what you need to look after yourself, your loved ones, your pets, 
for 72 hours. We think that even in a worst case scenario, help should be no farther than three days away. So you really increase your chances of, uh, of, of survival, of minimizing any injury that you may suffer from that. We do everything we can to prevent property damage, but first and foremost, it's a life safety issue. Anything that poses a significant risk to the health, safety, and welfare of any of our community residents, we want to make sure that we're well prepared to do that. We are best prepared to do that if each of our individual community members are prepared. So again, give some thought and consideration to that. Make sure that you are adequately prepared to do that and be mindful of the current situation. Um, a NOAA weather radio will give you the most accurate, timely information on any severe weather that may be approaching. That's one thing that we have to our advantage. Take, take advantage of that technology that is in place. Some of these storms do develop very quickly uh, and your uh, notification time may be brief. It may be a relatively small window. But like I said, when we know, looking forward now, National Weather Service is talking about the possibility of rain to start sometime tomorrow afternoon with the worst of it to come probably during the overnight hours in Saturday. So again, be mindful of those things. Uh, and like I said, taking the time and effort now to put some of those basic plans in place will, should minimize any ill effects that uh, you would see from the, the event itself. So, and I will be around to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. With, with that said, uh, if there are citizens out there who still have uh, questions, uh, we refer them to the city website, lincoln.ne.gov, of course. But more specifically, if they have questions relating to this storm incident, they can call 441-7441. 441-7441. That's 402 area code. And uh, uh, I, Carl uh, Eskridge from the City Council uh, is here today. I, I'm glad that you're here today, but uh, was not expecting you. Please thank, uh, thank you. And share just with us. just briefly, uh, it's events like this that really show what we're made of. And and when we have the cooperation of all the city and county departments, when we have our our wonderful communities of, of uh, nonprofits that come together to, to help people in need. That's, it just makes you really thankful that, that we live in a place like Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, so we're, you know, we're here not only to respond to this emergency, but we're also here uh, to, to think about, to, to problem solve, to look at ways that we can continue to protect our community in the future. So everyone who's, who's dealing with this issue, you know, we're, we're working with you. Any way that the city can be of help, any way that any nonprofits in the community can be of assistance to you, don't hesitate to reach out for those, uh, those helping hands because, again, that's, that's who we are. That's what makes us uh, the wonderful community we are. We'll recover from this, and we'll move on, and we'll be a better people for it. Thank you. Carl, thank you, and thank you personally, and... and uh and uh, I think we would all thank the other members of the City Council for, for, over the years, providing the resources that make it possible for us all to react in an active and effective manner. So thank you. And with that, questions? When Nancy? there's a water crest um, for assault, please. And also, is the reason for the issue yesterday simply the rain or did it have anything to do with development over the years without having you know better runoff plans well with regard to the quest uh cresting yeah, the, time the, the cresting is probably the best answer to that um as you go upstream to downstream the 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 downstream is the one that uh the, we we really kind of went by as to when that was going to crest and uh that gauge crested about uh, six o'clock. We once once we saw that uh, it actually hit uh, kind of plateaued and then started to drop. Um, a storm like this, uh, most of if you look at the Salt Creek drainage area, um, you know Lincoln contributes is actually a very small portion of the total drainage area that that comes into Salt Creek. Uh, so if you look for, to the west to to Garland and all the way south uh, to the county line, all of that area drains into, into Salt Creek. 
And so the bulk, vast bulk of the drainage area is, is open agricultural lands. And um, so the, if, if there is some urban development um, that has taken place, uh, that that would have taken place before we had storm, before the city had stormwater uh, storage or, uh, ordinances in place, uh, those made more impact than today. Today, development has a compensating requirement uh, when those developments take place to do some of that on-site storage. Uh, so even with urban development, it doesn't make much of a significant change. It's really the whole vast area uh, where the where that rainfall fell. Well, in, in several locations, we were actually uh, within about a foot of going over the top of the levee. Um, the Salt Creek levee is, is a system that was put in in the 1960s, designed by the Corps of Engineers. And what existed prior to the Salt Creek levees was a straightened Salt Creek channel that was done in the early 1900s. And when they straightened it, they just kind of excavated it out and dug and piled dirt on, on one side or the other. Uh, so part of the construction of the levees was reshaping that dirt that was already existing. And then other construction was filling in the gaps with new construction and new uh, of bringing in earth and making new construction. So what we, we do have a system of levees that aren't exactly even... Uh, on, on both sides and quite as even as, as we'd like it. We just uh, had some new photograph, aerial photography flown and we're going to get a better handle on, on where those low areas are. But obviously uh, something like uh, having it almost bank full of water will tell you is probably your best leveling uh, device that you have because it shows up very quickly where an area is a little bit lower. So those are small areas and we were prepared uh, to do some uh, temporary sandbagging uh, in those particular areas. Will you uh, make any recommendations on, on building up the levee or do anything different because of this close call? Building up the levee is something that has been looked at uh, a couple of different times uh, in the past. Uh, we've done some pretty extensive studies to see what it would take to, to build the levees higher, build in more capacity. Uh, you've got uh, more than 20 bridges that would all have to be modified. Uh, you'd have to build up the whole levee system. And the benefit-cost ratio of going from protection for a 50-year flood event to going to protection for a 100-year flood event, it's an increment of benefits that uh, it's, it's like 10 cents on the dollar of benefit to the cost. And there just really is not an economic, uh, even close economic return on that. So monitoring it, flood insurance, uh, doing and being prepared, as, as was mentioned, is really the best mechanism we have to deal with the floodplain. And, and something, um, is there a, a, is predicting when it's going to crest or how, how, how high it's going to crest, is that an exact science, or is it, is it, is it, is it tricky, especially in, in an urban setting like this? Well, it, it is tricky, and, and part of it is, is a challenge because Salt Creek has a number of tributaries that come, that join into Salt Creek uh, right in within the city. You've got Beale Slough, Haynes Branch, Middle Creek, Oak Creek, Antelope Creek, uh, Dead Man's Run, Little Salt Creek, all all coming into Salt Creek at different points along it as it goes as it goes through through Lincoln, and so each one of those we have to we've got gauges on almost all of those stream gauges, and so we're watching those stream gauges and seeing what they're doing, and in some cases it rained a lot heavier out at Emerald, and you've got a lot of flow coming down Middle Creek. And you may not have had the same amount of rain in another tributary. And so they're coming in at different times. And so you really, it's, it's really looking at all of them together as a system and trying to make the best estimate that you can. I guess, the, could you have made the call earlier to, you know, to start evacuating people, do you think? We could have, yes. 
um, and you can always make the call earlier. Um, but uh, I think we were um, probably at the at the the time uh, that we needed to make the call. Um, uh, I guess that's that we we waited as long as we could, but we knew that we couldn't really wait too much longer. On a scale of one to ten, how concerned are you that things can get just as worse as they did yesterday, if not worse, because of the rain that's coming this weekend? If I could predict how much rain and where it's going to fall, um, I, you know, I, a, a rainfall of this magnitude that we had that was that uh, prolonged, just storm after storm after storm, those cells were, were following the same track uh, pretty much that, that whole, uh, you know, multiple hours. Uh, that, was, that was fairly unique. And... Uh, every storm is going to be different. So, you know, we're, we, we know that how much water it'll handle, uh, but we don't know just how much water is going to get there and when. So it's, it's really very difficult to make that kind of, a, of an assessment. If we get the same amount of water in the same storm, I can make that prediction. Because the water or the ground is so saturated, right. it even less... Yeah, it will take less because uh, you know the in in when in the dry conditions that we had going into it, uh, you know the first amount of rainfall you did get a more uh, more that soaked into the ground, um, but that's you know that's once you get to that first uh, past that first half inch, um, and in, in an intense storm you're going to get you're going to get a lot of runoff. Sandbags standing by, ready in case there's. We've yeah, we're we're, we're prepared. Uh, we we work with the core and and uh, we have a uh, preparedness plan for that. So. I want to add some city folks on the on the flooding inside the city. You said that a lot of it had to do with the stormwater system. And can you kind of explain that? Because I think people think it's the river. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the same people that got flooded at the from the Teresa Street plant. In October, got flooded yesterday, and they called me, and mm -hmm. they want to know if you're going to do anything so that won't happen again. Ben will hand, handle. Uh, we have Ben Higgins here from Watershed Management. Donna Garden. They can handle the first question you had, Nancy, and then um, maybe Don and I can handle the second. Uh, yes, Ben Higgins with Public Works. Yeah, we have the inter interior system, but you know when Salt Creek gets so high up like that, all those gates and everything's closed up, and so it's whatever has the most pressure. And so if you have interior drainage and it's at a lower level than the creek, then it's not going to flood out. I mean, it's not going to flow out, and then you're going to get interior drainage flooding. And that's kind of what happened down in those, in those one areas where they had a lot of flooding, like Six and Old Cheney and other areas like that. So. Okay. But when the creek's that high, there's yeah. no way of preventing that, as I understand it. Correct, yes. I mean, unless, you know, like you were in New Orleans and you had some major pumps, and may, even big pumps like that really can't handle that kind of drainage at all. So it's just water's going to go where the highest pressure is. And so when you have Salt Creek real high, the interior drainage is just not going to drain. It's just not going to drain out. It's just not practical. Well, it does have to do with the river. Correct, yes. Yeah. So when the river's high, you're not going to get the interior drainage to drain out. So. Yeah. Water always goes downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Relative to your second question about impacted homeowners, uh, actually Donna and I have both received calls as well. Um, water, wastewater have received calls about issues in homes, and we're re reacting to them. I mean, I'm being vague, but at the same time, we're talking internally about how to address those calls, those concerns, and what to do in the long term about it. So we'll have more information for you next week, um, but we're still in dialogue about what to do relative to those properties. Okay? Yes? How, how much sewage did you, raw sewage did you guys dump into Salt Creek? Do you yeah. know that? Yeah. Yes, we are doing those numbers right now. It looks like on an instantaneous, we had about 300 gallons per second going into the, into the Salt Creek. Um, but that was for about a 12-hour span, as Mickey said earlier. And we'll have the total numbers later today on how many total gallons we did bypass around the plant. Yeah. And that'll be in the report to DEQ. Okay. Is that the first time you guys have ever had to do this? Yeah, we were uh, Mickey and I back. were talking about yeah. that this morning. Um, I don't have any record of another bypass, um, but I'm not sure, so I can't substantiate yeah. that. 
Can we, I bring a little bit more wine? Let me do that, please. Um, the system, as you know, the collection system is gravity pretty much in the city of Lincoln, and it flows down to our treatment plants. Mm -hmm. And everything goes there, no matter what. So our treatment plants are designed for a certain amount of water that they can process. And if you put too much water through it, you lose your whole biology. You lose, could lose some infrastructure there. There are some other issues that could happen. So this is like a relief valve. Um, all wastewater treatment systems have them. And if there's too much water in the system, it bypasses to the river. I would also just mention a lot of that water in the system, entering the system, is actually rainwater. So it's rainwater mixed with um, waste. So keep that in mind that it's not, it's, it is raw sewage discharge. But it is diluted, but yes. But it's diluted already from the collection system and, and being bypassed into Salt Creek. So just keep that in mind. And, and, and the, the creek goes down to, um, to the, the wells, you know, where Linton gets its water. I mean, is there any concern? No, actually, Salt Creek discharges downstream of our well fields in Ashland, so it is not a contributing factor whatsoever to our wells. And anyway, our wells come from actually the groundwater underneath, which are filtered pretty well before it gets to the well system. Right, and we have additional treatment. Well, there's groundwater treatment naturally, uh, and then there's <coughs> additional treatment at the uh, water treatment plant right. before it comes to citizens. I think Judy wants to tell us something about Debbie's truck. Okay. <laughs> You're good, Nancy. <laughs> um, just as a reminder, as, as, as we've talked about the city primarily, we do have folks that live in the county. Um, we've obviously mentioned some of the communities, Emerald, Sprague, Martell, Roca, that have experienced flooding in addition to the rural southwest area and southeast areas of the county. Um, all of the services that I mentioned earlier are not just for City of Lincoln. They're for all, any Lancaster County resident. So that includes the tent shots. That includes any assistance on environmental as well. So um, just to make that clear that it's, we're not just talking about the city's flood event, we're actually talking about the rain event in the county as well. And, and describe again when someone should consider getting a tetanus shot. Um, we, we were obviously encouraging adults only to be doing the cleanup so that we're not really talking about children. Our message is to adults, um, if they've not had a tetanus shot in the last 10 years or if they can't remember when they had one, which is most of us, uh, they need to be calling and getting information about that. We do have access to many of the records, but not all, but we will advise them. We have nurses that are staffed to advise them about whether they need a tetanus shot or not. Um, and if in individuals don't have insurance and they can't pay, we will provide those at no cost. So we don't want any of the cost or access to be a barrier. We want anybody who needs it to call and then to come get a shot. Thank you. Chief Bob, do you know how many people you guys have to rescue, do water rescues? Because you had 107 calls, but do you know how many um, rescue, uh, water rescues you have to do? You know, Andy, um, today's uh, duty shift is actually the shift that was on duty the night of the storm. They, they've been so busy responding to calls uh, we try to get our incident reports done immediately, but they just were overwhelmed by the call volume. So there are the cleanup reports, and I, I'd be guessing if I were to say a number, but I'm sure it was uh, at least a dozen or more. Um, we had several in the county, um, but I, I just don't have a, a real accurate number right now because I just don't have all the information in. And, and do you know how severe some of these rescues were? You know, most of them were, were what I would call relatively simple. As the, the, the vehicle drove into the flood water, the car stopped running, they were so far into the water they were unsure how to get out safely, and they just didn't do anything, they just panicked. I know we had one, uh, one victim that was uh, in water that was up to the steering wheel in his car, un unwilling or unable to get out, and we, we had to kind of coach him and coax him out of the, the vehicle. But, uh, you know, I don't think any of them were uh, what I would consider a really a dramatic rescue. They were pretty much just assists. But again, that's what we're here for. We're here to help people, and that's primarily what we did. And, and um, you probably heard or saw that there were some people who were either kayaking or canoeing, or you know, I guess there was one report of somebody tubing, you know, inside the river, or not the river, but the creeks in the yeah. We had a, uh, a report of uh, somebody going into the water after a f uh, an inner tube down near the Indian Center. Uh, we spent uh, some time down there yesterday uh, trying, to, trying to identify if there really was one. We had a, a caller that thought he saw something, but we couldn't confirm it. There was no other witnesses. There was no evidence of anybody going into the water. We did a, a, a fairly uh, a broad area search and couldn't find any indication that anybody had actually gone into the water for that purpose. Did see a lot of kayakers and canoers on the uh, water, 
in the Antelope Valley Channel near uh, uh, the Union Plaza. I was a little bit uh, surprised when I saw them late yesterday. I kind of wish they weren't there, but it was a beautiful sunny day, and I know it just looks so attractive, and that's the danger of these things. It, it looks safe, and it really is not. What, what would be the danger of, of, of even something like that, I guess? Well, obviously, um, the water, for, for one, we've heard a lot about the water quality, uh, the contaminants, but, but simply if, if the canoe were to overturn or the kayaker were to overturn and they are in the water, the water is moving fairly quickly and uh, they, they could get washed into an area where they could not get out of. And that poses a risk, obviously, to the person in the water, uh, to our people that, that are then forced to, to go in and get them back. So uh, there's, there's just a lot of hazard, and that's one of the reasons we've cautioned against. Uh, this is not a recreational watershed. It's, that's not what it's for. It's, it's much uh, different than that. And so we, we would discourage people from kayaking or intertubing or swimming or boating or anything that uh, they, they actually were doing. Um, what, what would you do differently, hindsight being 2020, on this entire? Uh, Andrew, I can't think of anything. Uh, I, I really can't. I think it, it worked out very, very well. The, uh, basically, the plans in place did exactly what they were supposed to do. We had the resources we needed. Uh, I was, you know, we don't activate the emergency operating center in the full bore mode very often. It's, it's just not something we do on a monthly basis. And it's kind of neat to see it in operation. Uh, and it, I thought it worked really, really well. The, the cameras, the, the public works department's network of about 60 pan zoom tilt cameras that they've been building for the past several years to monitor traffic flow and, and help adjust that. Uh, proved to be incredibly, incredibly valuable yesterday. We were in a windowless room in a basement, and to have uh, eyes on the scene uh, was really pretty remarkable, and something we certainly couldn't have done uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but we have four or five of those cameras, well, more than that, actually, that were just ideally located for seeing what the conditions were, and uh, very, very helpful. Do you know how much overtime at all, or how much? Uh, we brought in a couple of uh, uh, water rescue crews that would have been off duty, uh, so probably 10, 15 firefighters total. Uh, and uh, we held over second shift at the police, uh, first shift rather, at the police department. So uh, we'll have a few thousand dollars in, in uh, overtime expenses, but it's not, not giant. Won't, probably be about what we would spend on a football game. Is it fair to say, Nikki, that those expenses are being kept track of and accumulated for purposes of yeah. getting reimbursement from the federal government if we meet the federal government's criteria. So you will have that eventually, Andrew. Anything else? I'm not sure who this isn't a question for, but um, companies that come in that aren't reputable to help assist with cleanup. Yeah, I could. As, as Judy mentioned, that if you need cleanup, you need to make sure that it's done professional. The other thing, too, we hate to think that there are those unscrupulous people that will prey on vulnerable individuals. So that's what, when you're dealing with these things, if you're having any cleanup, make sure you're dealing with a reputable individual. If you have any questions about that, you can certainly contact us at Emergency Management to try and verify that. But when people are under stress like this, you want to make sure, give yourself that extra time to make a good decision. Don't feel pressured into doing it right now. It's very important to deal with it in a timely manner, but, but don't just uh, sign a contract or agree to a service with the first person that knocks on your door. Okay, are you good? I hope you can uh, see from the quality of the discussion today that the city has a great number of very competent people in different areas uh, to address problems like this. And so I hope the citizens of Lincoln will uh, take some comfort from the fact uh, that they have good people working for them up and down the line. Thank you.